Hello and a warm welcome to another edition of To The Point. On the show this week, former Attorney General of India and also Senior Counsel Mukul Rohatki. Welcome on To The Point. My first question to you, sir, is that democracy is almost like an implicit building which is, which is actually seen on the pillars of judiciary, legislature and the executive. But in contemporary times, when you look at this democratic structure, it almost looks like as if, you know, the pillars are under some kind of a strain. How would you really explain this perception? My experience shows that in the last about, say, 25 to 30 years, these three pillars, as you call them, there is some kind of a stress or a pull and a push between the three compartments. And uh, if you ask me frankly, the judiciary has moved beyond its compartment. Okay. And when it moves beyond its compartment, it encroaches into the field of the legislature and the field of governance. But do you see this as a healthy sign when judicial overreach becomes such a strong component? Look, I firmly believe that in a democracy, transparency is the most important thing. And if you have transparency, you will have some friction, some free and independent expression of opinion. So some amount of friction is healthy to keep each other in check. Right. But if the healthy friction increases beyond a certain proportion, then it is no longer healthy. But in the last few years, uh, the kind of pattern which we have seen, even with the former CGI, and it was almost seen as, as a kind of a situation where it was uh, Prime Minister versus uh, the Chief Justice of India. It was like, you know, the sparring between two major officers. You are right. And also in the recent, uh, recently when we saw the Law Minister Ravi Shankar Prasad on the Law Day, when he said that judicial overreach is the main reason for this strain between the two pillars. Well, so, I would broadly agree with the Law Minister. Okay. On your first aspect of your question. Right. When the former CGI was there, I was appearing for the union government. And it was an ugly spat in court about the number of judges being appointed and one right. somebody blaming the government and the blaming government blaming the court, etc. That was not in good taste. And the Chief Justice should not have done it on the judicial side. These things are worked out in closed doors across a discussion. That was bad. But when the uh, next Chief Justice came, he realized the sensitivity, he closed it. But this recent uh, uh, thing which I saw on TV two days ago, see my experience as a lawyer has shown that the court has moved from its traditional role. I am not saying that it should not have moved. It's the last resort for the public right. if the government doesn't respond. Then what do people do? They have to go to court. That's fine. But in the last 30 years, the courts have taken over the role of governance. Right. For example, I can only give you some examples, but there are hundreds. Mm -hmm. Whether the rivers should be interlinked or not, what should be the height of Siddhar Sarovar Dam, how should this function, how should a bridge function, whether you should have hydel plants or you should not have hydel plants, whether you should have uh, Bt cotton, whether you should not have Bt cotton. These are, these are issues of governance. The courts are not experts in these, in these fields. It has gone from all these uh, uh, situations even into the field of the legislature. But when you talk about uh, the fact that the courts have gone beyond their reach, now from municipal functions, like for example, maintenance of parks, drainage systems, all those comments have been coming from the court to also entering the policy domain as, as what That's you just what I'm spoke. saying, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, did, I mean, is it right to look at the courts like that? Should they have entered this domain? You're saying that just because the governance was not happening in the right direction, probably that was the reason why the courts intervened. Yeah, that's true. But you know, there have to be some limits, some Lakshman Rekhas. 
Okay. Somewhere. I can understand something here, something there, fine. But it cannot virtually become an uh, overarching situation where the courts are actually uh, running uh, the government. Right. In some of these examples I have given or, or more examples. Now, whether you should have music after 10.30 p.m. at night in India, <laughs> is that for the courts to decide? Whether you should have fireworks on one day or two days, these are not functions for the court. The court could monitor it by saying that, look, there is a problem. So why don't you formulate a policy? Mm -hmm. The government will formulate the policy. The court could overlook and oversee at best. That is the role of judicial review. But when but, a person, yeah. when a person like uh, Chief Justice of India, Deepak Mishra says that the governance can't be compartmentalized, it cannot follow a mathematical formula, uh, then obviously when, when the political fraternity listens to comments like these, they obviously see it as some kind of a battle of ego, battle of supremacy. Uh, look, how does one read? Look, everybody is governed by rule of law. Courts, the government and parliament. One of the basic principles of rule of law is the three pillars as you said and the three compartments and the separation of powers. Everybody must respect it. Let me give you an extreme example. Right. Suppose parliament was to say tomorrow that look, you keep chiding everybody but you are not able to solve the problem of overburdening of dockets. Four crore cases are pending in this country for the last so many years. If the judiciary knows all, then why is it suffering under such a backlog? Can parliament tomorrow say that we will start deciding cases? It's possible. Somebody can say, well, if you can't decide a case in 25 years, maybe I can decide a case. You know, it will lead to that kind of a situation and it does lead to some kind of heartburn mm -hmm. that if parliament is to debate laws and pass laws, then they will decide what is good for the people. It's not for the court to decide what is good for the people in that sense, even if it is well-intentioned. So now we have something, what is called, you know, the, 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 the courts can't direct parliament to pass a particular law. So a new tool has been developed over the last few years, starting from that sexual abuse at workplace, right. that Vishakha judgment. Right, right. That till parliament passes a law, we pass a verdict and that takes the place of law. Right? So it's a kind of an interim law placed by a court till parliament legislates. Mm -hmm. That is not contemplated by the constitution. Law means law and law is that which is passed by parliament. But we, we have seen that the political fraternity also gets offended with the number of PILs which are coming. I mean, the PIL revolution started in the 1980s. But even recently when Ravi, Ravi Shankar Prasad said that PIL, PILs cannot become a substitute for governance, how far is that statement justified? See, I think that's just a statement. But if you, if you go behind the statement, mm -hmm. PIL was a tool devised by Justice Bhagwati in the early 80s. It was really meant to subserve the interests of the poor the downtrodden, the handicapped, the illiterate, the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Those who couldn't go to court, and the best example which comes to my mind is Bandhuva Mukti Morcha. Right. Right? Bonded labor. It was meant for that. Now from that it went on, it went on, it went on, and today, in every high court and the Supreme Court, there are thousands of PILs. And a large number of those PILs, my experience tells me, are really motivated. Okay. They are not really espousing the cause of the poor and the downtrodden. A so lot of them are, are rivalries, political rivalries, economic rivalries. You start some investigation in a rival camp politically or otherwise. All that is kind of stuff is going on. So, you know, it's, you're riding a tiger and you don't know when to stop. Right. But do you think that the time is ripe now to formulate certain guidelines on the quality of PILs which, Look, which are coming in? As uh, uh, President Attorney General K.K. Venugopal also said. Recently. See, I, I would put it this way. There are one or two judgments of the Supreme Court which say that this is 
a weapon which should be used carefully. There should be antecedents check and stuff like that. That it is not private litigation, it's public litigation. Uh-huh. But you know, those guidelines are not really followed. Huge amount of PILs are going on. According to me, there is need for a law. Parliament must... For PILs, you're saying? Yes, Parliament must pass a law uh-huh. in regard to PILs. And then that law can have safeguards. Today, somebody starts a PIL against, let's say, a TV channel or let's say against a, a, a big economic entity <clears throat> and the press. I'm sorry to say the press because you are a part of the press. The press, whether it's electronic or newspapers. Next day, there'll be a front page news. So and so to be investigated by the court. Mm-hmm. What is going to happen to the reputation of that person? Whether it's good or it's bad. So as far as the public is concerned, people start saying, look, there's something wrong here. It can cause incalculable damage. So everybody must be circumspect in seeing what the PIL really is. And all kinds of PILs should not be entertained, especially when the courts are not equipped to do that. And according to me, a time has come to take stock of the situation. We have very, very heavy and huge backlogs in courts and these things are clogging it further and further. So according to me, there is need for a law to be passed. Right. But when you specifically talk about uh, judicial activism or the judicial overreach, I would like to discuss two, three examples with you. And the first one is, of course, uh, when Supreme Court overturned the National Judicial Accountability Bill and that people read that, you know, it undermined Parliament's authority. Yeah, well, I was defending that uh, law. And uh, according to me, the law was correct. And Parliament passed it with overwhelming majority. Mm -hmm. The states passed it with overwhelming majority because you required half the states also to do it. Right. And there is no constitutional bar in passing that amendment of the Constitution. And it was necessary because what was not a part of the compartment for the judiciary under the constitution had actually been taken away. So do you think that this is one of the major reasons which has led to so much of uh, trust deficit between the the executive and the uh, the judiciary? I think so. I think so. Because I don't agree with the judgment of the Supreme Court at all. Mm -hmm. Because all that means, all that it means is that we are, we means the judges are the best equipped to appoint judges. Right. You know, you can't have that situation. I cited constitutions of about maybe half, I mean, not half, about 40 or 50 countries, from Asian countries to European countries to Latin American countries. Nowhere in the world do you have a provision that judges will appoint judges. You look at America, the Senate, they have a TV debate. That's how judges are appointed. How can three people sitting in a room say that we we know the best? So you must have participation of the public also, participation of the law minister also, a healthy discussion, and then there should be an appointment. So to strike down that appointment, I mean the procedure for appointment, which was constitutional, is completely, completely flawed, according to me. But in this kind of a scenario, when there's such a deep chasm between these two pillars of judiciary and the executive, what is the way out now? Because uh, the constitutional sovereignty, which 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 is there as part of the narrative, how do you really uh, ensure that, that, that that's there between the two pillars? I think both should stretch out. There should be no ego involved on both sides. They should sit down, take a stock of the situation, practical realities, start building bridges and then realize what each one has to do so that there is some healthy respect. That's the only way that you start shaking a handshake. That's the way. But the kind of message which it sends out, because uh, recently on the law day, when Prime Minister was also present in that function, and then this kind of a verbal duel happened between the present Chief Justice of India and the Law Minister, uh, you obviously 
said that you know some friction is is healthy but when it reaches a proportion like this and the kind of message it sends out in the society that look judiciary and the executive are not on the same page uh, is it really a worrisome trend then it's, it's true that it happened on a public platform yeah. when the prime minister was there maybe it could have been better discussed in closed doors but the point is as you said that the divide is becoming deeper greater and, deeper, and greater deeper, deeper, deeper. once that happens these things have to come out and uh, you know ultimately it's the press which plays it up you know for, for for everybody to know what really transpired it is magnified many times by the press but beyond a point it's okay i don't i don't think there's you call a but, spade a spade but can the press bridge this divide see the pre- press also in this country is a little too trigger happy you know the same thing is repeated 100 times uh, on the electronic media and you know people start believing as if it is the truth so the press also must play, must play its role it's a, it's a very important uh, uh, it has a very important place in the constitution freedom of expression is the most prized fundamental right which the supreme court has protected most zealously so with huge amount of power and rights you have equal amount of responsibility you know so it's the press which should have its own introspection to see what should be played up and what should not be played another two examples of uh, judicial reach uh, overreach of course uh, which were heavily criticized a lot of editorials also came out and that that were that sc directing the center to conduct need a uh, neat that again does not uh, go very well according to the doctrines of the separation of powers and the other one is of course that the order for banning diesel uh, cars in delhi which led to a lot of uh, protests let us take one by one yeah. as far as neat is concerned i think what the supreme court did was correct you must understand that we have more than 25 states or about 25 states you have students all over india different states followed different policies M- uh, mbbs is a prized course so it, you know it, it, it's it's very very imbalanced a student in delhi or a student let's say in mysore a student in delhi with good marks is unable to get admission because of domicile because of regionalism right and a student in mysore with much much lesser marks can get admission this was leading to a lot of heartburn and it led to a huge number of cases in the last 30 years which i have been seeing so to have a centralized neat exam which is on the pattern of a centralized iit exam there is nothing wrong in that and see for a year or two you will have some pin pricks here and there right. but by and large it will be streamlined and all students have a chance instead of a student going and running to 30 centers to give exams you not be able to afford to go to 30 centers so you have one exam you give you have a list of say 10000 people and according to merit it is done i don't think there is anything wrong in that and the government should not say that it was wrong or politicians should not say it is wrong that's one second in regard to diesel cars in delhi i think that is a knee jerk reaction that should have been left to the government to devise a policy for the court to say that you should put in a tax by way of assess on big diesel cars is complete arrogation of power for purposes of taxation right. which is the role only of parliament so you could say that look is creating a problem come out with something and then mind you delhi is not india it's the supreme court of india it's not supreme court of delhi right so whether you should have fire crackers in delhi whether you should have diesel cars in delhi that's not the end of all problems i mean diesel is spread all over the country so it's creating a pollution is creating it all over the country somewhere more somewhere less so these are issues of policy conversion of bs4 into bs6 B, you know this petrol and conversion and all these are really matters of policy and they should have been left for, to to the government to devise policies and come up with policies rather than putting a fiat it's like a fiat you have a diesel car you pay this much you have this you pay this much Now NGG is saying you have a ten-year-old car, phase it out. How do poor people phase out cars? It's not easy. It's not easy. So it cannot be a knee-jerk reaction. It should be left to the government to apply their minds, devise policies, 
which are by and large equitable and fair. That's what should happen. But whenever a policy is framed, as, as the legal experts say, and also uh, the present Chief Justice of India said, that whenever a policy comes out, it's a constitutional duty of the courts to actually assess the policy. And uh, the lawmakers or uh, the people from the executive, they cannot comment on this. So how, how would you look at this look, statement? Is it really a constitutional duty on the part of the courts to, oh, I'll tell to assess you. the policy? I'll tell you. It is the constitutional duty of a court to see whether a law or an executive action or a policy is in accord with the law of the constitution, right? So constitution is the highest level, a law is the next level and a policy is the last level. So we have a concept called judicial review. Right. So it is judicial review of either a parliamentary legislation, a judicial review of a government action, say blacklisting somebody from contracts. So that's action, judicial review will be available. But there are norms of judicial review. Mm -hmm. The norms of judicial review are that if a decision is taken which is fair, the court does not substitute itself as the decision maker. Right. Right. In matters of policy, the law is that greater and greater latitude is given to the policy maker. Right. The court can't say, look, this policy is not as good as I would have framed it. Mm. That's not the function of the court. Right. It's the function of the government. As long as the policy is there, it's fair, it's not unreasonable, the court should accept the role of the policy maker and not devise it this way that I could have made a better policy or a better policy would have been this or that. But you, again, you know, the, the, these are limits of judicial review, like your limits of three compartments. So if, if you have encroached on the other compartments, the scope of judicial review is also obviously become wider. Now everything is open to judicial review. So that's the problem. But, you know, whenever this kind of a controversy erupts, each pillar says that, you know, we are into self-regulation, we have our own systems of checks and balances. There are checks but, and balances. Absolutely. But despite all this, you know, the barriers are always broken. Media always hypes up uh, the issues. So how would you really See, for media, define those boundaries? As far as media is concerned, you would best know and you speak for the media. As far as checks and balances are concerned, yeah, it's, people say that. But when actually actions are taken, you know, people kind of forget uh, what the self-controls are. No, but when, when a minister like Arun Jaitley, he, he uh, just a few days back also he said, and also in the earlier years we've seen that, you know, uh, judiciary is trying to break the legislature brick by brick. And it's like a tyranny of the unelected, very strong words, you know, coming out from inside the house. So how does one pillar draw the Lakshman Rekha? As I said, introspection, okay. maturity, reaching out to each other, start building trust between each other. That's the only way. And mind you, ultimately, it's the person in position which really, uh, you know, shapes the whole thing. If you have good people, mature people, who have no personal axe to grind, things become better. I mean, I can give you, take an authoritarian example, right? Take the former uh, Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Mm -hmm. He ruled Singapore for 50 years with an iron hand, right? He was all in all, one person, authoritarian. But he changed the face of Singapore. So it's really the person, you know, the, the kind of person that you are, and one person can change. One person can change the nation. I'm sure a few people who are mature in parliament, mature in the government, mature in the judiciary, if they brainstorm, they can do it. But the problem is that they don't seem to come together. Why can't we have a round table meeting of some politicians, some government functionaries, and uh, some of the judges sit around and talk? That look, kind of frank discussion, Behind closed doors. So, which means what you're saying, not enough of dialogue is taking place between That's the judiciary obvious. and the law. That is process. obvious. It is obvious. There so is what? no dialogue. Right. Dialogue is necessary. And and one <clears throat> should not feel slighted by the fact that somebody can have a dialogue. What's wrong with the dialogue? Nobody should feel 
that this compartment is higher or that compartment is higher. All three compartments were similar in the constitution. No doubt about it. And mind you, the Supreme Court has power to quash a law like they did in NJC. Right. But parliament has power to undo a judgment of the Supreme Court also. Right. According to certain norms, it can undo a judgment. It happens every day. So, you know, these are checks and balances. So, it should not be seen as being slighted. Oh, a judgment was delivered. Parliament has, you know, done away with the basis of the judgment. These are functions. You know, it's like a high court judge. He should not feel slighted if his judgment is upset by the Supreme Court. Because that's the system in which we work. So, they, but there are some people who get slighted, who feel slighted. That should never happen. A district judge will, should not feel slighted if his order is set aside by the high court. These, these things happen. So, real thing is maturity, self-control, and above all, I have said it earlier also, have an audit. You know, like you have a financial audit. Right. You can have a legal audit. That in the last 30 years or 40 years, what have we done? What are the good steps we took? What are the bad steps we took? I ultimately finished a couple of months ago, you know, the, the case relating to Sardar Sarova, the dam. That case was pending in the Supreme Court from 2001. It was finished in the reign of Chief Justice Kehar. The cost of the dam went up by 25,000 crores because it was pending in the courts. Right? So, if you take a legal audit, you would say, look, maybe this entertainment of this PIL was, or this type of PIL is not correct. This, this is what the cost is. This is what the delay was. Right? You could have an audit on the credit side, Bandhuva Mukti Morcha, this, that, or the other. These were the good things. So, let us move on this direction and give up this direction. That's what the purpose of an audit is. So these are some things which can only happen if all the three wings sit together and, and, have, have, a dialogue. and have dialogue and brainstorming. And that is not happening. No, it's not happening. And one final comment before we wind up the show. Uh, there was a phrase which I, interesting phrase which uh, came across and that is that activism can be a medicine but not a daily bread. That is how the, yeah. the workings of the court have been perceived. Yes, I, I, I would entirely agree with that. Okay. See, as I said, PILs are a very, very important weapon. If you use a weapon every day, it's going to get blunted. Right. Right? If you have antibiotics every day for everything, small thing, <laughs> it's not going to work on your body. Right. Yeah, it's something like that. It was a pleasure talking to you, Mr. Rodki. So that's it on this episode of To The Point. See you next time with another personality. Goodbye and thanks for watching.